Okay, it looks like everybody's here. Okay, great. Then let's get started. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming to this afternoon's License Commission meeting. It's Wednesday, October 5th. Um, present this afternoon, myself, Natasha Yakovlev, Commissioner Jennifer Ewers, and Commissioner Helen Kahn. This meeting is being Zoom recorded. And we're going to start with some public comments. And I just want to point out we have two public hearings on the agenda. So if you're here to speak, to offer comment on either the dirty truth or the office, hold off until we get to that um, portion of the agenda and you will have an opportunity to speak then. But we will, um, Annie is going to go through whoever is here for public comment. You'll have three minutes to speak. It's not an opportunity to ask questions of us, unfortunately. It's just an opportunity for you to um, speak to something that's currently on the agenda. So is anybody here for public comment? If you just want to use the hand raising feature. Oh, thanks, Annie. Um, it's under reactions. Nobody for public comment? Nobody. We want to make sure anybody in the Zoom here, if you want to speak, now's your chance. Okay. Oh, we have. Um, we have oh, I see a hand. Yep. <laughs> We can't hear you, but you're unmuted, so. I wonder if you're connected to audio. Are you able to send her a typed message? Oh, Did we lose? she is. She Marketing. Oh, okay. There's an assist. There, there have been a few more people that have joined. Okay. So for people who've just come into the room, we're in the um, public comment portion of the meeting. If you wish to make public comment, use the reactions option on the bottom of your Zoom screen and raise your hand and Annie will unmute you when it is your turn to speak for three minutes. Are there any other hands that you see, Annie, while we wait for marketing to get their audio going? There is not, no. I don't want her to lose the opportunity to speak. Um, I can see if I can send her a chat. Thanks for your patience, everybody. Hmm. And Anna, you've unmuted, right? Because I mean, the little mute symbols there, but. Now, I mean, I did before I can, I will ask again for them to unmute. Oh, looks like just one. Yeah, they're un, I um, think, yeah, they're unmuted, but we still can't hear them. All right, anybody else? Last call for any other public comment? None. Annie, what should we do? Um, I say we, well, I think Mark, the marketing, I think she's here for an actual agenda item. Okay, then we'll just jump in to the agenda. Okay, so moving on, application, um, agenda item number three, applications for short-term liquor licenses. This is for the Academy of Music Incorporated at 274 Main Street, 
wine and malt license, and they're requesting a fee waiver for the following dates. Sunday, October 23rd, 5 to 11 p.m. This is for the home free concert. Friday, October 28th, 7 to 11 p.m. This is for Blackmore's night concert. And Saturday, December 17th from 7 to 11, this is for the One Roof fundraiser. And is Melissa here? Hi, Melissa. Annie's gonna unmute you. I am, I am, I'm just... Hello. Hello, how are you? Hi, I'm good, how are you? Great. So anything new and exciting and different in how you're doing this? No, nope, it's exactly the same thing that we've always done. All right. Do any of the other commissioners have any questions? No, I don't. No questions. Okay, then I will make a motion to approve the short term applications for the Academy of Music as outlined in agenda item number three and also approve the uh, request for the fee waiver. Second. And uh, Natasha? Yes. Helen? Yes. And Jennifer? Yes. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Melissa. Bye, everybody. See ya. All right, thank you. And next up, we have a short-term liquor license for Click Workspace at nine and a half Market Street on Saturday, November 5th from 7 to 9 p.m. This is for a music presentation by Pamela Means, and you'll be serving wine and malt. Is someone here from Click? Yes, I'm here. Hi, how are you? Good. Can you Thank just you. let us know your name? Uh, Mary Yun, I'm the executive director for Click Workspace. And tell us a little bit about the event that you're having. Um, it's a music showcase and it's free to the public. And we're going to be serving beer and wine. And will it be handled the way you've handled? Yes, yes, we past? have a safe serve server and yep. all of that. Yes. And we have a note that the liquor liability insurance hasn't been submitted yet. It actually just came in. Um, oh, perfect. Yeah. I about... apologize. It was it was okay. a miscommunication on my part and the we just didn't have an updated insurance declaration page for that. Yeah, great. It's all set then. Um, do the commissioners have any questions? Nope. No Would questions. someone like to make this motion? Uh, sure, I'll make a motion to approve the application for a short-term liquor license as detailed in item four on the agenda. Perfect, thank you. Second. <clears throat> and uh, Natasha? Yes. Ellen? Yes. And Jennifer? Yes. All right. Thank you, Mary. Agenda item number five, application for short-term liquor license for Pioneer Valley Racing, LLC, October 16th, 2022, from 9 to 1 p.m. at Look Park at 300 North Main Street in Florence. And this is for the Happy Valley Half Marathon and 5K Family Race. And you are requesting a wine and malt license. And do we have someone here from Pioneer Valley Racing? Hi there. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Good, what's your name? Uh, not Megan, Justin Killeen. Okay, nice to see you, Justin. Um, so you've done this in the past? Yep, this is our seventh, uh, seventh year. Great. And can you just let us know again how your set eight plan to set things up? Um, so it'll be in Look Park and it'll be over by the pedal boat pond area and um it'll be about 600 runners and everyone will finish in that same area that we start in and then we'll have um, a lineup of food and, and um alcohol vendors uh at the finish line and do you how is there a specific area where the people who purchase alcohol stay yeah um they all have to have um we used to use wristbands. Now they have them on their on their um, on their bibs. But yeah, it's all con congregated down towards the very end of that um, that kind of access road, or uh, it kind of goes off to the left down by the pond. So that's where everyone is down there. Okay. Do any commissioners have questions? I don't. I know you've done it before. So no, no I've been there in the past. No. Okay. Great. Then I will make a motion to approve the application for short-term liquor license as outlined in agenda item number five. I second. 
<laughs> I think we just got the second. That was <laughs> <laughs> Natasha. Yes. Helen. Yes. And Jennifer. Yes. Great. Thank you so much. I hope it's another good event. Thank you. <laughs> Item number six. Application for short-term liquor license. This is for the trustees of Forbes Library at 20 West Street on November 2nd, 2022, 5 to 7 p.m. This is for the Arrive at 5, and it is a wine and malt license with a requested fee waiver. And do we have someone from the library? Hello. Hi, I'm Maxine Schmidt. How are um, you? I'm well. Great. Uh, have you hosted an Arrive at 5 at the library before? I don't believe we have. We've done, you know, the wine tasting with the Friends of Forbes before, but but not this one. Mm -hmm. And do you plan, what's, how do you plan to set things up? It'll be um, in the reading room and the, the, um, the restricted there, it'll be restricted access to the, to the uh, people who've replied. And um, we have a serve, serve safe person doing the pouring and it'll be artisan cider um, doing the donating the, the cider for, mm -hmm. the, for the event. Okay. Are there any questions for Maxine? None here. No questions. Okay. Would somebody like to make a motion? Sure. I'll make a motion to approve the application for the short-term liquor license for Forbes Library, along with the fee waiver as detailed in item six on the agenda. I, I will second. second. Sorry, <laughs> Jennifer <No>. second. <laughs> and Natasha? Yes. Helen? Yes. And Jennifer? Yes. Great. Thank you, Maxine. Thank you all. Have a good evening. You too. And next up we have item number seven, an application for a short-term liquor license for Building 8 Brewing, October 27th, 2022, 7 to 12 a.m. The Club Delph Halloween Party at Bombix, 130 Pine Street in Florence. And this is a wine and malt license. Do we have O'Brien here? Don't see O'Brien. Um, okay. you, have you heard, heard from him? Do you know if he was planning on coming? I, as far as I know, unless that's his phone number, but... Um, I don't think it is. Okay. Um, should we go ahead and discuss this since it's the same... He has done this um, venue repeatedly. Yeah, I mean, I'm comfortable with going ahead and approving it because it is because he's come multiple times and there's never been any issues. So, yeah. um, okay, yeah. then I will make a motion to approve the application for the short term liquor license as outlined in agenda item number seven. I'll second. And Natasha? Yes. Helen? Yes. And Jennifer? Yes. Moving on to item number eight, request to rescind a previously approved short-term liquor license, again, for Building 8 Brewing at 320 Riverside Drive. This was an event that took place on September 24th, 630 to 940, for the Florence Night Out After Party at Bombex at 130 Pine Street in Florence, and it was a wine and malt license. And um, he would like to rescind the license because he decided to not participate in the event. I have no issue with this. Does anybody have any comments uh, no no i mean yeah so it came in obviously before it came in a little late it wasn't yeah it wasn't the day of that he realized no one was showing right up. right it could have been a little <laughs> earlier but it's yeah. fine uh then i'll make a motion to rescind the previously approved short-term liquor license for building a brewing is outlined in agenda item eight a second and natasha yes helen yes and Jennifer. Yes. Number nine, request to change hours on an all alcohol restaurant license for Serious Hospitality Group, LLC, DBA, TELUS, and the Satellite Bar at 150 Main Street. They would like to extend their hours from 1 a.m. to 2 a.m. And hello, Amanda. Hi. How are you? I'm good, how are you? Good, how is it going? It's going great. It really, we haven't had any issues. Um, people are very excited to be there. Um, I mean, last, last Saturday, I had to say with all the love in my heart, get out. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. It's a good problem to have. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, so you're interested in extending your hours. Yes. Um, you have read and signed the rules for extension. Correct. Um, and just as a, a reminder, nobody can be served after 140. That's a hard, hard stop for last call. Um, do you guys have any questions or comments for Amanda? My comment is, I think this is fantastic. I mean, this yeah. is, I mean, this really has been a discussion in Northampton that there's no nightlife. So um, kudos to you. And so I think anything we can do to support this being successful, I'm all for it. Thank you so much. Agreed. Yeah. <laughs> all right, then. I will um, make a motion to approve the application for the change of hours on the annual all alcohol restaurant license as outlined in agenda item number nine. And I'll second. And Natasha? Yes. Helen? Yes. And Jennifer? Yes. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, item number 10, application for a new entertainment license for Rias Bashas LLC, DBA Homestead, 7 Strong Avenue. The proposed entertainment is indoor live music for later night bar programming. The proposed days and hours are 10 p.m. to 1 a.m. Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Hi. How are you, Jeremy? I'm here. Doing Hello. well. Good. How's um, everyone else? Good. I'm good, thanks. Um, can you tell us what you're hoping to do? Yeah. Um, so first, I want to welcome our new commissioner. Uh, you see me a lot here. So uh, hello to the new face. Welcome. Um, Thank you. So what we're uh, what we're working on is uh, an extension of um, our Thursday through Saturdays programming. Realistically, these will most likely happen on Fridays and Saturdays. Um, we're looking to have live music, and I guess uh, I should amend that to that. We also probably have working on with some DJs as well. Uh, just trying to have some kind of uh, entertainment going while we keep the bar open a little bit later uh, on the uh, Friday and Saturday evening. Uh, trying again. Like my partners over down the street, you know, trying to reinvent the nightlife here in Northampton and reinvigorate. Um, so just trying to cover all our bases so we can uh, try and put on a, a good time. So <clears throat> before your um, ownership, there was mm -hmm. another establishment there that had late night entertainment. Right. And there was an issue for some of the residential units. Okay. On the street. And at that time, and Annie, correct me if you're wrong, if I'm wrong. Um, I think that the people running the restaurant then did do some sound modifications. Uh, to mitigate that. I can't be sure, but I know there was a lot of back and forth with the neighbors and yes, they weren't, yeah. they weren't successful in mitigating the sound. Right. And part of it, I think was um an unwillingness to really mitigate the sound so i think so just uh, as yeah i mean i appreciate the the heads up and the, and the warning um i think you know we've shown that we're always going to work with uh, you know you guys and, and any authorities uh to work to you know, create something for our neighborhood yeah um, you know i don't i don't expect it to be a very loud situation we just kind of wanted to make sure that we were covered especially because we are going into the the early hours of the morning, um, but we can of course work with our neighbors. There's no one upstairs currently as a as a you know, living tenant, so I'm uh, hopefully not worried about that. Um, but we also, since the previous ownership, we've installed sound paneling and, and tried okay. to reduce our noise internally as well. So um, you know we haven't had any issues with our upstairs neighbors when we're playing music in the kitchen either. So my guess yeah. is that uh, we should be okay. And of course, let if there's any issues, let us know. We will uh, we'll turn the we'll turn the volume down or uh, increase our sound panel. Okay, that's reasonable. Do the other Cheers. questions have a comment or question? No, I don't, that, that was before my time. So that was interesting to hear, but yeah, I I trust that Jeremy will, will work out if there's any issues. Yeah. Showing he do that kind yeah. of thing. If I, if I might, I don't know if this is, I know that this is after the uh, submission and, and uh, I don't know if this is the right way to go about it, but as I hear a lot of times in these uh, these meetings, is it possible to get a fee waiver? Uh, a fee waiver, fee waiver. <laughs> um, uh, a fee waiver, as we are only probably going to be doing this for the two months of this year, and then we can do that fee uh, when we resupply, resupply for next year. 
So the fee waivers that you hear are for um, two city entities being right. the library and the academy. Sure. And, oh, that's right. Yeah, so that's the reason that they're there. And I've not known for a fee waiver to be granted otherwise. Um, Annie, do you know of any? No, it's just because there's there's city buildings. Yeah. And yeah, totally, totally fair. I just figured I'd throw the question out there. Might as well. And yeah. now, I, now I've learned something new as well. So I appreciate that. <laughs> Great. All right. Um, then I will make a motion to approve the application for the new entertainment license for uh, Rias Bashas LLC at Homestead, 7 Strong Avenue. Second. And Natasha? Yes. Helen? Yes. And Jennifer? Yes. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks, Jeremy. Uh, Annie, I guess I'm going to bring you up a check before we finalize this, but I'll bring that up uh, before the week is over. Okay, I'll send you an email tomorrow. Great. Thank you so much. I appreciate everyone. Thanks, Matt. Yeah. All right. Item 11, application for short-term liquor license for McCallum Dry Goods Incorporated, DBA Cedar Chest and Noteworthy Thorns at 150 Main Street for Wednesday, October 14th from 5 to 8 p.m. This is for the Stay Golden Grand Opening Renaming, and they would like to be serving wine and malt. And do we have someone here for that? That's me. Oh, hello. How are you? Good. I kicked my boss out of her desk so I could Zoom with you. Oh, okay. Good, <laughs> <laughs> good idea. Um, can you just let us know your name since I don't think you've been to us before? No, I haven't. I'm Katie McLaughlin, and I've been working with Cedar Chest for about three and a half years now. Great. Thank you for coming. Um, why don't you just let us know what you are, what this event is all about? Um, last summer, Cedar Chest opened a pop-up in Thorns called Cedar Chest Fashion. We had hoped to be there for eight weeks and be successful, and we knocked it out of the park and decided to become a full-time entity here in Thorns. Um, with that being said, we've decided to um, give the space its own name and identity and branding and marketing. Um, it's still part of the Cedar Chest family, just as Noteworthy is upstairs on our second floor. Um, it's just time to throw a party and kind of give the space its, what's, what it's due, its own. Great. Hurrah. <laughs> well, congratulations on that. That's exciting. Thank you. We're really um, happy to be here. So your application was originally for an all alcohol license. But yes. Is, so, but you're just seeking wine and malt? So I was under the impression that we could do all alcohol being told that we can do all just wine and malt is fine with me. Um, yeah. Amanda from TELUS and the Satellite Bar is our serve safe and tip certified person. Yep. Who's actually doing the event for us. Um, so she'll be on hand and the server. And what do you have in mind for keeping people in the space with beverages rather than roaming out and shopping around with drinks? We haven't had any issues in the past with these sort of events in Thorns. Um, mm -hmm. So we plan on keeping everybody primarily in the store or at the storefront. It's all interior in Thorns, yeah. not roaming about. Um, and it's during, business hours. Yep. It, sorry, just it doesn't I thought Thorns closes at six. Or is it just for five to six? And this is five to eight though, right? This is five to eight on Fridays and Saturdays. Thorns is open till eight. Oh uh, uh am I looking at the wrong thing? Oh you know what the day is it wrong. Says, so oh okay it says Wednesday. October, yeah it's Friday. October 14th, Friday, October 14th. Friday the 14th. Oh because it okay. says Wednesday. I just I believe everything I read I guess. I know. <laughs> <laughs> did not double check the date. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, Jennifer, do you have any questions or comments? I don't, but congratulations on the store success, especially Thank now. You. I know it's a hard time for, for stores, so it's encouraging to hear you're doing well. Thanks. I appreciate it. And I just want to, I didn't quite understand. So is it I, that you hope people won't go and wander? Or is there sort of someone posted by the door to make, with drinks, someone posted by the door making sure that they're just drinking in that area? There'll be somebody posted. There'll okay. be plenty of staff on hand. Gotcha. <laughs> I think we've got okay. all hands on deck for this. Good. Great. Glad to hear it. <laughs> all right. Would somebody like to make the motion then? 
Uh, sure, I'll make a motion to approve the application for a short-term liquor license by McKellum Dry Goods as detailed in item 11 on the agenda. Um, correction that it's Friday, October 14th, not Wednesday, October 14th. Excellent, I'll second. And Natasha? Yes. Ellen? Yes. And Jennifer? Yes. Thank you all so much. Thanks, Katie. Come join us. Mm -hmm. I think I'm going, oh, you know what, I'm going to be out of town or I would, but I'm great. sure it's great. We'll see you around. Thank you. Bye. Bye. All right. Item number 12, application for a new lodging house license, Gandhara Mental Health Center Incorporated, DBA Gandhara Center at 25 Graves Avenue in Northampton. Managers Stanford Dempster and Patricia Buffard. And do we have folks here? Hello. Hi, I'm Linda from Gandhara. Patricia could not be available. She's one of my colleagues. And um, we run a, a residential treatment program here at this house, has done it for the last, I believe, 19 years. I'm new with Gandhara in the last six months, so this is a little bit new to me. I do have a colleague, uh, Melissa Sanchez. She, you know, if she can be unmuted in case she needs to answer any questions, I'd appreciate that. And um, we are doing our annual health inspection that we do every year to meet our funders requirements. We are a R3 group home and we can have up to 16 male residents in this program. And um, when we were applying for the health inspection this year, um, they were um, requiring other items in the kitchen that was not in the past. And when the, the building the health inspector went to the bill uh, commissioner of the health department and human services said that we actually would fall under the lodging uh, license up like, you know, to apply for that instead. And uh, because the uh, residents at the program, they are there, uh, they are not related. You know, she ruled, she wrote down the, the code that would fall under as a lodging house. So she sent us the application that we submitted to your um, department to apply for this license. And uh, at the, you know, so I, this is new to us that um, they refer us to you for us to apply for this license as a lodging mm -hmm. house. We were a little bit concerned because this is new to us and how this impact our program. And um, I was told that this would not impact as being a group home. Um, I guess, uh, by my understanding, it has to do with the kitchen, uh, right. the health department to apply for this license. Yeah, it's the first time I've seen um, a lodging license come through in seven years. So it's new to Oh, me. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so yeah. uh, you know we were it's new to us, and when we should do the right thing, you know yeah. we are looking to go back into the house. The health department is going back there this Friday to do their annual health inspection, and with this one, um, you know uh, we are applying, and uh, you know if there's anything else we need to do to make sure it happens that we can open the house, so we're like looking for guidance. Sure. So the programming is staying the same. I know this house commonly is referred to as Harrison house. Yes, correct. So the same programming's happening. It's not, so I just assumed it was a whole new situation happening there because this is the first time we've seen this. Yeah, no, so, the same okay. program. Melissa Sanchez um, is part of the program. And so nothing has changed, not the footprint of the house. Mm -hmm. We've been doing some re re renovations there, meaning the existing footprint. Uh, the house had a fire there last winter. So we had to relocate our residents and they have, have been working with Bay State Restoration, which they are done. So now we are following up through the, I believe it's DPH, you know, going through all our requirements to make sure we can move back in. Okay. Um, Melissa, did you have anything that you wanted to share? Oh, she said it okay. all. Uh, well, I'm good. <laughs> um, we do have one question that Melissa actually brought it up earlier. So I think Melissa should ask that question because again, this it's not all of us. Yes. So I believe they were saying that we have to share the names of the residents. And I was wondering how um, that's possible due to 42 CFR and HIPAA. That's a good question. Um, Annie, we do not for this license. We do not require that. Okay. I don't know who told. Was it somebody it's, from the health department? It's written on the code. That's why we are. You know, we have the code that um, was sent to Patricia from uh, the Jasmine Ward from the health oh. department, and the uh, you know they lay out 
the whole thing, you know what I mean? The code, that's why we're. Yeah, so that, I would direct that question to the health department. Jasmine isn't, is part of the health department. Um, so for this license, no, we do not require any of that. That's great. Okay. Yeah. Make a note of that, thank you. Okay. Yes. Yep. Now on the record. Um, did Jennifer, Helen, do you guys have any questions for? Um, yeah, I mean, I'll admit I'm sort of confused by the whole thing, and I don't know. I mean, I'm somewhat newer to the commission, but I was surprised to see this coming in front yeah. of us. Um, and I, I guess I want to make sure that it's absolutely necessary that they want to do uh, that they need to get a license from us. And I don't know if there's a fee associated with it, but you know, I certainly wouldn't want them to pay any fees that they don't actually have to pay. If and and you know, this has been around for a long time it sounds mm -hmm. like suddenly it's become this thing that they need to, to get mm -hmm. the license so I guess I, I would love to have some light shed on that if anyone has information about why, why it's was it an oversight previously or is it incorrect now I guess yeah. I just want to make sure that we're doing the right thing I I can forward the email um I don't have a right now that was sent to Patricia from Jasmine and uh, with her talking with the commissioner of the department, she advised that the kitchen does not require a variance of the sink. That's one of the requests after all the ACLG are correct that they were asking for these things that the, it was not needed in the past. So I don't know if it's something new. Um, because it is not the commercial kitchen, but rather a lodging rooming facility as such has house will need to be permitted as a lodging facility with the, the you know, H with DHS and she was going to send us application so we follow our um, recommendation mm -hmm. I mean if we don't need it I agree uh, we were all surprised but we want to do the right thing we want to bring our residents back into the house they've been dislocated uh, they've been out since uh, I believe um, December of 2021 because we had to do all that work at the house mm -hmm. um, and uh, so we need to bring them back to the community because Part of it, that's what they need to be to get the service they need as well. Right. So that's just that. We just want to do the right thing. Yeah, so it sounds like, just so I understand it, it sounds like this all sort of started in the kitchen, so to speak, like that it was because they were viewing the kitchen and they said, they said you do not need something that you would need in a commercial kitchen. Is that what you said? So they are saying so, um, when they came to do the annual inspection, and I do not know if Jasmine is a new inspector. And again, I'm only been here six months with uh, myself, yeah. Gandra, so I don't have the history. But my understanding from the the facilities director in the program is every year we do the health inspections. This was the first time they were asked potential to have a hand washing sink, okay, and potentially even a grease trap. Oh. So we were, you know, we were looking into that, obviously, but then when Jasmine went to, must be her supervisor, you know, she it was directed this way by the email that we got from her. Okay, so, so, sorry, the so saying that you do not need those things because you're a lodging house, you're not a commercial. Right, so it, it, it does, if it's yeah. an application for a lodging house, you will not require the sink. Yeah, so right. my concern would have been if you if you receive this license are you then subject to making more changes that none of us would have been aware that you would be subject to because we don't want to impose that i i certainly hope not because yeah. we do have um, you know the three base sink already in the kitchen yeah. you know yeah. to meet that the health um you know requirements that we need and we have an ansel system and everything so i'm confused as well a little bit yeah. annie do you have any insight into why this would have happened now um my understanding is that it's always been a lodging home but yeah. it was never licensed as one and okay. so when jasmine went there she said she she told me she said this is not a new lodging home it's been unoccupied for over a year for renovations after a fire took place but i just wanted to put it on your radar because it doesn't seem like it's ever been licensed as a lodging house okay um, and that's when I then I contacted Patricia and let her know that it needed to be licensed as a lodging house. And do you in your have you discovered anything that might indicate that this would make them subject to additional inspections that they haven't been subject to in the past or not? I mean, the license commission doesn't do inspections. Right. Um, we don't require any inspections unless there's a liquor license. So there will be 
getting a lodging house license would not, through the license commission would not impose any additional inspections as far as this license is concerned. I can't speak for the health department. Yeah. Um, yeah. We do, re I'm sorry, we do require for our funder uh, health, fire, and yeah. building inspection, which we do annually. We have sure. all of that. We do that every year. We have yeah. to, to be operating. Yeah. And in other communities that you're in, have you, do you need a lodging license? It's We are, we are in, um, Melissa, if I'm not correct, we are in uh, Ludlow. And what else, uh, Melissa? We have Ludlow, Westfield, Holyoke, Springfield, and then Northampton. And is this your only house in Northampton, or is there another one? It's our only house. Okay. Don't we have all oh, with this program, right, um, um, Melissa? We have other houses for different programs, mm -hmm. right? You are correct. Okay. We do have other um, houses, for different programs. Definitely want to get you up and running again, so the residents mm -hmm. can return. Yeah. Um, Jennifer, do you have any thoughts? I'm just questioning why we haven't seen this before, if there are other similar programs in the city. I know I, I hate approving an unnecessary license, but I certainly want to get your residents back in the home, so. So the reason you haven't seen any is because all of the lodging house houses have been licensed. Like, And it's a one-time license, Annie? Is that why they're not coming annual. back? annual, so there's oh. seven or eight other ones that get renewed annually, so it's not, so I guess I don't want I don't want this to be confused as like there's no other lodging houses licenses in North. Oh, okay, so you have seen other other establishments have this license. Yeah, we have eight or nine of them, and okay. they get renewed annually. Um, okay. There just hasn't been any new applications in your time as being as being okay. on the license commission. That's okay. the difference. Okay, yeah. then that's thank you. That clarification helps a lot. Absolutely. Yes. Okay um then it is necessary and i'm ready to approve yeah. it unless there are other questions did you have anything else you wanted to share with us or you were you're good no I, I think i do have a question being a lodging and being a group home i understand it's not going to affect our group home you know status from annie she sent me an email clarifying that so i think we, we are fine i see if we have to do it annually what does that entail again do we come here to reapply or is it going to be no, automatically it's just, it's just paperwork you do and mm -hmm. annie do you prompt everybody I just send is out renewal paperwork it will probably be mid-december um and it's due back um mid no excuse me i send it out mid-november and it's due back mid-december um and it's just paperwork and uh, the renewal fee. So it's an okay. annual license and it expires the 31st of December every year. Okay, okay. How much is the, the fee? I don't remember. It's so $50. $50 annually? Yep. Okay. All right then, I will make a motion to approve the application for the new lodging house license at um, Gandhara Mental Health Center at 25 Graves Avenue. I second. And Natasha? Yes. Helen? Yes. And Jennifer? Yes. Great. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Alrighty, moving on. Number 13, application for short-term liquor license for Think Tank Brewers, LLC, DBA Progression Brewing Company for November 12th and 13th from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. for the Northampton International Cycle Cross Race at Look Park at 300 Main Street in Florence. And this is a wine and malt license. And do we have someone here from Think Tank? Yeah, Zach Wright, I'm with Progression. Hi there, how are you? Good, how are you doing? Good. Um, I think you guys did this event last year, right? We did, it'll be very similar setup, same location. We've got, uh, we're gonna be the only uh, alcohol on site, but there's a few other food trucks straight across, straight in the same area. So should be pretty straightforward. Yep. Like under the tent, like it was last year. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, Jennifer and Helen, do you have any questions? No, I don't. Nope. This is a long-standing event. Yep. 
Excellent. All right, then I will um, make a motion to approve the application for the short term liquor license for think tank brewers um, for the event outlined in agenda 13. I will second. And Natasha? Yes. And uh, Helen? Yes. And Jennifer? Yes. Great. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Sure thing. All right, item 14, we have a public hearing on an application for a transfer of an all annual all alcohol restaurant license, transfer of a common victualler license, transfer of an automatic amusement device license, and an application for a new entertainment license for the office at 320 Riverside Drive in Florence. It's transferring from Patricia Willard, transferring to and the proposed manager being William Akers Jr. The uh, proposed entertainment is up to a four person band singing music and the proposed days for entertainment are 7 p.m. to 10 p.m., <clears throat> excuse me, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. So I will make a motion to open the public hearing. Second. Is there anyone here for public comment regarding this item? None. Is there, is William Akers here? Yes. Hello, how are you? Hi, good, thanks. Great, so um, congratulations. Thank you. New place. Want to <laughs> just let us know what your plans are and have you been working there? Have you been associated with it? Um, I've been there going. I know the owners for like 20 years and been talking with them a while about buying it. And they finally decided to come down on the price enough <laughs> and offer right. it to me. So, <laughs> so I decided to buy it. Um, okay. Hopefully do the kitchen back. They have a kitchen that they had shut down and uh, revamp that in the future. Made to try to do some food trucks first mm -hmm. outside. Mm -hmm. uh, fix up the place. Have you owned a, a bar before? A bar, no. Okay. No. A restaurant, pizza restaurant okay. years ago in Enfield, Connecticut. Yep. Jennifer and Helen, what questions do you guys have? Yeah, and so is it, I should know this, is it currently open or are you reopened? Yes. Okay, so you're Still just, open. You're just yep. seamlessly taking over and continuing. Yep. Okay, great. And for the entertainment piece, um, it's entirely possible entertainment has been happening there and nobody knew a license was required. So just because there's a residential neighborhood across the way. We always yeah. like to make sure people who are getting the new licenses are just respectful of neighbors and things like that. Yeah. And um, I'm sure- I'm one of them. I'm one of the neighbors too. I live right across the oh, way. Oh, perfect. <laughs> nice. right, I live right on Lad Ave. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. Yeah, you're right there. You can yeah. walk to work. Yes. Perfect. Okay. That's probably going to be more of like a one or two person. Yeah. Inside. It's not a real big spot right. inside, so- yeah, I was just thinking down the road if they have some kind of event outside. I know uh, Building Eight; they're over there, and they had some kind of events usually yep. for certain. But yeah, that's more for that. Okay. Um, do Jennifer and Helen have further questions? No, I don't. Okay, no then I'm here. And um, did you have anything else you wanted to share with us before I close the hearing? Uh, no, I'm all set. Okay. Thank you. I will make a motion to close the public hearing. Second. All right. Um, yeah, I mean, all the paperwork's in order. I think it's great the place is staying open and it'll be sort of judged up a little bit with some yeah. ownership, <laughs> new life. Yes. Um, yeah, so I have no I have no problems approving this. Neither do I. All right. Then. Motion if you'd like. Yes, please. All right, I'll make a motion um, to approve the application for the transfer of licenses and the application for a new entertainment license for the office as detailed in item 14 on the agenda. I will second. And Natasha? Yes. Uh, uh, Helen? Yes. And Jennifer? Yes. Great. All right, thank you very much. Good luck. Thank, thank you. Okay, moving on to 15, we have another public hearing on an application for a transfer of an annual wine and malt restaurant license with a cordials liquor permit, the core permit, transfer of a common victualler license, and transfer of an entertainment license. 
for the Dirty Truth at 29 Main Street. It is transferring from Lanran LLC to Moore Hospitality Incorporated, and the proposed manager will be Kyle Anderson. The proposed entertainment is occasional live music for events like Jazz Fest. Other music acts include acoustic and low volume electric amplified instruments. The proposed days and hours of entertainment are between 7 and 10 p.m. Start times may vary, but will not go past 10 p.m. Dates vary based on city events and availability of musicians. And make a motion to open the public hearing. Second. Excellent. Is anyone here for public comment on this transfer? Seeing none. Kyle, hello. How are you? Hello. Good. How are you doing? Good. Um, do you just want to let us know what your what your plans are as the new owner? Um, yeah, I mean, um, I'm basically just carrying the business on. I've been there for uh, 11 years now um, yep. and have essentially been running the operation since 2020. So, um, yeah, I mean, um, not changing much as, as far as uh, the basic operations, but uh, just continuing to try and grow the business and grow the food and beverage scene um, in this in the city so mm -hmm. great no it's done it's I've watched it change over the last couple of years and it's great mm -hmm. what you've done um, Helen and Jennifer any questions or comments I think it's exciting that it's doing so well and that it's going to continue on so yes <laughs> yeah and it's great you've uh, you've been there it's transferring to you so there's um, there have been no problems there in the past so I'm ready to make the motion. I'll make a motion to close the public hearing. Second. And then I'll make a motion to approve the application for the transfer of the annual wine and malt restaurant license with a cordials and liqueur permit, transfer of common Vic license and transfer of entertainment license for the dirty truth as outlined in agenda number 15. I second. Natasha? Yes. Helen? Yes. And Jennifer? Yes. Great. Thanks, Kyle. Thank you. Have a good evening. Uh, you too. Yeah. All righty. Item 16, application for a common fixture license and a new entertainment license for Bombix Center for Arts and Equity at 130 Pine Street in Florence. The proposed entertainment is concerts, lectures, film screenings, poetry readings, dance performances, theater, workshops, conferences, classes, and multimedia events. The proposed days and hours, on average, there will be two events per week on any day of the week from 8.30 a.m. to 10 p.m. Occasionally, programming will last until 11 p.m. And hello. Hey, How are how's you? it going? Good. Um, good. Welcome. Um, it's your good first time here. I was saying welcome. It's your first time here. Yes. <laughs> and just want to let everybody know your name. Sure, I'm Cassandra Holden and I'm the executive director of Bombix. Excellent. Um, so you are, you're getting the common picture license which triggered your appearance here for the entertainment license as well, but you've been um, having concerts and events at the church for months now. Um, yes. And you just wanna let us know what your plans are moving forward. Sure. So we'll continue to do what we've been doing. And it's worth noting that we have an informal agreement with our neighbors. So um, when we have weekday programming, that typically ends by nine o'clock, um, you know, out of respect for the neighborhood. But on weekends, we go until 10. And in our agreement with them, you know, we have the option to go until 11 for special events with the provision that we let the neighborhood know in advance. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're also, you know, continuing to, you know, have meetings with the neighbors. We also participate in a list listserv um, to address concerns and let people know what's going on. Um, all of our events are, and the time of, of, of course, are published on our website and on social. So it's, you know, everything is very visible. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've been, we've been doing concerts, hosting conferences, film screenings, lectures, the things listed in the permit application. Um, and then, you know, working with our city council and the planning department and, you know, various city offices to, you know, address concerns about traffic and parking and noise and all of the things that come with, you know, repurposing this beautiful historic church into, you know, 
a venue that can host events, but also, you know, a commercial kitchen, which we're on the path to become a commissary kitchen that we can rent out. Um, and then, of course, we hold um, private events like birthday parties and weddings and bar mitzvahs. So we're we're a multi-use space. Sure. Okay. So since it was um, prior to the common victor license, you were working with the mayor's office on getting the mayoral entertainment license. So we have the notes from that, which is really helpful to sort of round out what you're hoping to do. Right. And um, I noticed that in the notes, you were hoping to have 30 outdoor events. Is yes, and that it's worth noting that um, that, you know, a big part of that is in response to COVID. For example, we have a bar mitzvah rental coming up on the 22nd of this month that was intended to be inside, fully inside. Um, but they've now requested that, you know, that event take place outside because of the rise in COVID numbers. Yep. Um, and so, you know, we I feel like we, it's important for us to be able to make those accommodations because what's happening is still very uncertain. Sure. Yep. And for a vet, so for something like a bar mitzvah, is there amplification for that? Is that what it, how, what will that look like if it is held out? Right. So for that event, it, you know, it is a dinner and dancing event. Um, but, you know, they have a hard stop at 10 because that's a Saturday night and that's in compliance yeah. with, you know, the other parameters that we've established. Yeah. And do you plan to also, or is your hope to have outdoor concerts? Yes. Um, and then, you know, other examples of outdoor use would be, for example, when we hosted the Power of Truth conference in June, um, there was a lecture, an artist presentation that we had outside, um, you know, that was, it was amplified in that, you know, we had a small PA so the speaker could, you know, be heard by a crowd of, you know, 50 people in the afternoon. Um, but that's not, you know, that's not necessarily, you know, that's not a rager that's going until. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Things, I mean, the, the out, outdoor events like that, I don't see as a burden on the neighborhood, but my concern is having outside concerts because then it becomes an outdoor music venue. And the question then is, is this the appropriate place for amplified out, for an outdoor music venue that requires the amplification that the amazing entertainers and musicians you are getting would require. Um, and, and, ha, and I don't know how those, what the, the level of, I mean, you're getting Sean Colvin, like the level of, of people that you've been able to book is incredibly impressive. And I don't know how that level of amplification is going to um, fit within the noise ordinance for the city. Sure. Well, I mean, most of the, I mean, the, the, the way that I read the noise ordinance, right. It's a, it's an average that's measured over time. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we have measured, we've measured the sound at our events. Um, and there are certainly, you know, sort of moments within concerts where it will be louder, but that's not typically, you know, like something is not typically at that volume for that duration. Like, you know, as you can imagine in, in a performer set, like there might be a, a ballad that's very quiet and soft, and then there might be a more sort of raucous dancing song. And so over the course of that performance, you know, the average is within what's stipulated in the noise ordinance, but there will be moments where it's noticeably louder and then moments where it's much quieter. Um, it's also worth noting that as we have measured sound levels around the building, you know, depending on where you are in the neighborhood, a car passing by the outside of the building is actually louder than, mm -hmm. you know, what you can hear in the backyard mm -hmm. if you're standing on the street. So would you have an outdoor stage constructed? Um, well, I'm, I mean, in, for the purposes of this application, like we're not you know, we're not looking at constructing a permanent outdoor stage. We're looking at having some occasional outdoor programming in the summer months. Um, yep. And has the outdoor piece, have you guys talked to, and because, and I also saw the notes um, with discussions with neighbors and I, I commend you for all of you for working together on making this successful for everybody. Um, 
have you, how have the neighbors received the potential for the outdoor entertainment piece, the outdoor concerts? Um, well, I, I think we've had some really productive conversations. Like, yeah. of course, you know, their concerns have chiefly centered around, you know, around sound and about parking and about around traffic. And, yeah. you know, we've, for example, been working to mitigate the traffic and parking pieces by taking advantage of adjacent lots nearby. Um, you know, we are monitoring sound levels. We didn't do any outdoor concerts this past year. Mm -hmm. um, the year prior to that, we did do five shows outside to sort of test the waters and see how that would work. Um, and we learned a lot in that process that I think through, you know, positioning um, different elements of the sound system so that the sound is directed away from the neighborhood and, yeah. you, know, you know, that will help a great deal. And we're also, you know, working with our architect and, you know, bringing in a series of consultants to really help us, you know, understand the property and how best, like, it's in our interest to be good citizens. Oh, and yeah. 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 No, <laughs> and not trying to have like 30 loud rock shows in the backyard. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, so we're, you know, looking at different strategies, like, yeah. you know, ev everything from, you know, looking at insulating and sound mitigation on the inside of the building. And is there, you know, fencing or some other kind of planting or things that we can do outside, you know, making tasteful choices about our sound system, measuring levels. Like, yeah. I think it's really going to be a learning process for us. Like, I don't think we have yet found the perfect solution, but we're like in it to figure that out. Yep, totally. And we're in a similar process as a licensed commission with COVID and bring, you know, so many people having outdoor entertainment and, the issues that have arisen. So we're on a, on a, we're learning as we go also. And so all of the questions that we're going to be asking you today are because of, you know, where we've seen other people stumble, quite honestly. So, yeah, it's been challenging. I mean, you know, we had hoped to have concerts outside over the summer and to be perfectly honest, like ticket sales for everything that moved inside, they were terrible because people just, yeah, they didn't want to come inside. Like people yeah. are, you know, cautious. And if they're going on vacation with their family or, you know, getting together, like, you know, they're making really careful choices. Yep. Yep. Definitely. Um, Helen and Jennifer, what are your thoughts? I'm trying to visualize where is the outdoor? I mean, because I guess I don't know. It's behind the building. There's, there's space behind the building. Thing. Yeah, at the back of the building, Cloverdale Preschool has a play structure and there's a large sort of rectangular lawn with big pine trees that overhang one section of it. Oh, okay. So how many people does that hold in that backyard area? The so, many, the, um, so for the concerts that we have had outside, um, we will typically, you know, we'll sell about 300 tickets in advance because in, in the event of rain, that's as many people as we could bring inside. Yeah. Um, you know, as part of our ongoing work with the city, um, I need to invite the fire department back for an inspection related to the kitchen and an inspection related to the building, you know, and ultimately, you know, they will be able to set that capacity, which I think is probably closer to 500 people just based on the, the square footage of that space, but we've never sold that many tickets because we've always wanted to be able to bring people inside right. if the weather changed. Gotcha. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, and you can sense we're being cautious just because, you know, we've been sort of bit in another area um, of Florence, but at the same time, I understand, like, there's the Florence Thursday night series, too, which has never been an issue, and they certainly have outdoor music. Um, I don't know if it's equivalent, and I think they stop pretty early, those Thursday night yeah. ones, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, that goes from, like, 6.30 to 9.00. To nine, yeah. Which is when we stop on Thursday nights also. Our weekday programming typically stops at nine. Okay, yeah. Because I, I guess it just feels very different than anything else that we've we've been responsible for approving because, you know, we're approving it's a restaurant or bar and right. they have some music on the side. Whereas this feels like, as sort of as Natasha suggested, it's like we're approving a concert venue for an outdoor concert venue, which it feels outside of what anything we've ever done before. Is, right. I mean, at least certainly in my my time uh, right. Um, here. Right. Coupled with that residential piece, you know, I do try right. to imagine if I were in the house next door. Um, yeah. So there's a lot, but I do commend your efforts working with the neighborhood. I mean, I've seen firsthand. I've walked by and I've seen your no parking signs. <laughs> um, I I know those efforts are are there. So I do commend that you've really tried to be a good neighbor. Yeah. 
Thank you. Um, for everything that they both just said, it's it is hard to without hearing from neighbors. Um, it's hard to approve to completely approve this license. Say okay, just have at it as you want to outside. Do your thing. I absolutely hear what you're saying um, in terms of the efforts that you've made, and I know you're going to continue to make those efforts. I have zero doubt about that. But because of you know Jennifer articulated it really well, is and Helen did as well. This is this is like a concert venue. We have we have to look at it in that way um, for the outdoor piece. I have no issues with approving the entertainment license for the inside, um, for the, you know, bringing the bar mitzvahs and things like that outside as people, you know, respond to COVID. It's the, it's the regularly programmed potential for the outdoor amplified concerts that I, I feel like I would like to hear from neighbors on that. Um, Helen and Jennifer, I'm also completely open to hearing another point of view on that. Yeah, no, I, I, I mean, I'm sort of with you, Natasha, and, and I'm sort of going to restate, I feel like we're out of our depth in a, in a way, um, because this is such a new thing for us to be asked to make an approval on um, yeah. this kind of entertainment. And, you know, we did certainly during COVID, people moved music outside and then Sometimes it worked out and sometimes it really didn't. But like I say, that was sort of like, it was a restaurant or a bar that also had music. It wasn't a concert venue, which also is serving a little bit of food, um, you know, or, or drink. Um, so, but I don't know if it's sort of, you know, something that we are even allowed to say like, oh, we are partially approving the entertainment license, but there's a hold on the outdoor. But I- you can do that. I guess, I don't know. Um, I mean, based on our experience this past mm -hmm. year and a half, two years, where we have encountered issues, I think it is much better for everybody involved if we don't do something and then have to walk it back. That gets really tough. And um, and I think it's, you know, I, I because you're already doing so much, Cassandra, in terms of mitigating the the potential impact of everything on the neighborhood i feel badly that you're now burdened with us <laughs> <laughs> have to also deal with that aspect but that's just the reality of it and and it and i hope that in the spirit of the way we do this that it really is to help everybody be successful and um bring really cool things to florence and northampton and that's you know that's that's our all that's our goal always is to support these efforts and um and because this is so different, I, you know, I would, a motion that I would make is to approve the common fixture license, approve the um, indoor entertainment as you've outlined in your application with the, um, with stopping short of approving the live amplified music outside until we have an opportunity to hear from the neighbors. Can I propose um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, another thing? Could we have, um, <clears throat> would it be possible to approve say 15 or 20 of the outside events and then come back for the next, like, and then have input from the neighbors and come back? I'm just, for example, thinking of this bar mitzvah, which is happening on the 22nd. Yeah, I don't want that to, yeah, no, I'm, when I say the live, I'm, I'm thinking more in terms of the concerts. The yes, I was, uh, Natasha, I was going to say, yeah, part of what Cassandra's saying. I mean, and I don't know if we can say the type of thing because it's, you know, an outdoor bar mitzvah feels very right. different than an outdoor concert totally. show. But, but is it? I mean, it's a DJ and it's a sound system. Right. Like, I think it's different. Absolutely. You're not selling tickets to a bar mitzvah. It's right. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's more but that you do have to bring a gift. You have to bring but, a gift. It's not being marketed, it's not being um, promoted. You know, it's, it's, I, to I, to me, they're apples and oranges. Yeah. So, so for and, example, yeah. Sorry. I'm yeah. Sorry. No, I, to, I just want to point out that there are a few neighbors here. Um, I know they didn't raise their hand during public comment. I just yeah. want to point that out. You are in, under no obligation to hear from them because this is not a public hearing. But just so you know. But do we can? I can make the decision if they wish to speak now. Is that an opportunity? You are the chair. You can make any decision you'd like. Then I'll do that. I mean, if neighbors who are here would like to speak, I'd be happy to hear from you. And if not, that's fine too. We can 
They would just need to raise their hand so I can unmute them. Okay. So we have one, Kyle Homestead, you are about to be unmuted. Hi, I, I'm, I'm not a neighbor. I'm, I, I work with Cassandra and I'm part of the Bombix team, but um, I'm a sound engineer by trade <laughs> and very much involved in, in sound measurement. Um, and, and I actually work on sound measurement projects for many other venues and other places too. Um, but I, you know, I, I do want to push back just a little bit on like a ticketed show is very different than um, than a bar mitzvah and the way that it is marketed. But it's actually, you know, in terms of just sound measurement and and what that means, like at the property line, it's not necessarily any different. You know, I mean, we, we've held memorial services in the back with bands um, that are celebrations of life. There's all kinds of things that have gone on historically there. Um, and when when we did some of the initial um, uh, events that that happened outside, um, you know, we we actually did move around the neighborhood and and listen and take measurements and, um, you know, and 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 start to understand what that was. Um, but you know, I, I do think that this this sort of has bearing on all the different types of events that go on there, not not just concert events because there's so many events that have you know involve music. You mean even the you know, the, the Yom Kippur celebrations that are going on right now were supposed to take place outside um, and they involve music as well. And that's and that's fine. And and I'll push back a little bit on you on a you know, it's it marketing a concert is different than having a private held religious event or family mm -hmm. event or wedding or something like that. And if touring musicians are, as you know, have requirements for sound and all of that sort of stuff that a DJ or you know, a hired wedding band might not necessarily do. So, uh, you know, I, I I do think that they're two different things. And I do want to reiterate that we want this to be successful. So we're not, you know, the, the questioning and the concern isn't out of a doubt that, that Bombix isn't doing what they need to do. It's that we need to make sure that this, that you have the opportunity to be successful moving forward. So I see that we do have two more hands. Um, do you want to unmute either Scott or Carrie? Yep. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Scott Laidlaw. I live at 122 Pine Street, uh, right next door. Mm -hmm. And I actually attended today because I wanted to express support for Bombix to get uh, for their application for their entertainment license. We really like what they're trying to do. We really want them to be successful. We want the church to be preserved and we're excited about what they're trying to do there. So I want to say that off the bat, we have had some friction uh, when Bombix started. There were late shows that were quite loud uh, that were difficult. We reached out to Bombix and were eventually able to meet with them. And not just us, um, Carrie, who's also on this call is my wife, we live together, um, but also several neighbors. There's about five or six um, households in our immediate neighborhood, all within eyesight and earshot of Bombix, who have been involved in uh, talking with Bombix and giving them feedback as to what our experiences have been. And we do really appreciate the efforts that they've made as, uh, as everybody's noted, like the parking, I think that Cassandra and Kyle have done a great job in trying to figure out how to address something that is pretty hard to to address, it's hard to herd cats, so to speak, and they've done a lot to make uh, make that better, and I appreciate that. They've also done uh, some work around the noise, like for example, this summer keeping windows shut on the sanctuary, even when it was really hot outside and probably pretty hot inside, to contain some of the noise. Because when the windows are open, it's it's quite loud; it leaks out, um, and so we do appreciate that, and we feel like we can work with them and we hope that we keep talking uh, and keep meeting. We have quarterly meetings planned. We don't have the next one set up, but it should be coming up very soon. Um, we've talked about sound testing, something that we're talking about now and about which I've reached out to Kyle and Cassandra. We had talked about doing that together and I'd still like to do that to understand how sound transmits through those walls um, I'm an architect by trade. I know I've been doing some work at the uh, 33 Holly uh, Arts Trust building around sound transmission. 
um, which is kind of it's, uh, uh, Kyle, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I get the sense it's a little bit different than sound control inside of space to make good balanced sound so you can hear high range, low range. But um, I've learned a bit about sound transmission and also living next door to Bombix, I've learned a bit about sound transmission because a lot of noise bleeds through that, uh, that wood frame building, which apparently doesn't necessarily have a whole lot of insulation in it right now and doesn't have storm windows on those big, beautiful windows. Um, and so even, even with the windows shut, we've still had shows that uh, I think, you know, I don't have good equipment. I have an iPhone with an app on it that I was able to calibrate against professional equipment and it seemed to work pretty well. It was off by about a decibel and a half at 93 decibels. So it seemed like it was pretty good. And I've registered that some of the shows with the windows closed are actually exceeding uh, those limits. And, you know, it's a relatively close thing. It's within 10 decibels, um, but it's still something that we hear in our house with our windows closed and we, we have to close windows. The impact is actually quite real for us. I think as next door neighbors, we hear it more than any of our other neighbors, but from talking to other neighbors, we also know it's an issue for those folks. So I really appreciate the commission um, being mindful of that and thinking about the impact of the outdoors. We have expressed to Cassandra and Kyle that we are concerned that, that uh, the outdoor concerts are gonna be really loud for us. And I mean, really loud. We know what they were like last summer when the concerts happened. We were home for, I think maybe two or three of them. Um, and they are really loud. And we do share a property line with them that stretches back about 300 or 350 feet from the street. So we get, our house absorbs a lot of sound, even if it's blocked right from in front of the church by the church itself. So we are very sensitive to that. And I, I appreciate your thoughtfulness about that. We do intend to keep working with Kyle and Cassandra on this. We appreciate what they're doing and their willingness to speak with us. And hopefully going forward, we can keep uh, hashing out the issues that we do have. Um, thank you for giving us the time to talk right now. I appreciate it. I'll, I'll stop now. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. And can you unmute Carrie? I think she, she put her hand down. Oh, are you all set, Carrie? Oh. Um, yeah, hi everybody. Uh, nice to see some familiar faces here. I just wanted to echo just briefly what Scott said that, you know, we do very much um, support Bombix getting this licensure. And um, you know, for me, the point of question about noise, right, is just how are they and how is the city going to support them to act to comply with the noise ordinance and how do we know that, um, you know, any given particular show is or is not. Um, and I think there is a distinction between the indoor and outdoor shows for sure. Um, and so I'm, I'm just wondering if it would make sense as this commission considers the outdoor portion to have someone from the city come out with Bombix and any interested neighbors to do a sound test, um, you know, or whatever that even means. I am not an architect. I have no idea what that actually means other than the app on my phone, but, um, you know, to understand like, what is the appropriate limit? Because for me, that's just really the issue, like just right. complying with the, no the noise ordinance. ordinance. Um, yeah. But everything else has been just, you know, has been really great. A lot of the programming has not been loud, but as Scott said, when it is loud, it is very loud and disruptive for us. We love the parking signs. We love the programming. We want it to go forward, you know, all of all of it. So um, it, that my, my my inclination is just to think about like what information can we get in place to make sure that this will work for everybody around the sound. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you. So we have, and Jennifer, I think this might've happened before you joined us. We have had um, an instance where the building department was asked to go and uh, do a sound check to help support a business that had brought music outside. And it was done after that establishment had added some significant, um, made some significant changes to the acoustics and stuff. And, and then we wanted to make sure it was within the appropriate bounds. So that is something that could certainly happen again. 
Um, but Helen and Jennifer, what are your what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think it brings up a good point. I mean, to, to we do have the building department there. Um, and if, I don't know if it's something that we could say outdoor con concert, like allow one. I mean, I, although now we're talking about concerts and bar mitzvahs, and I know that they're the same, if different. Um, so I don't know if it's just that we allow one or five events, but that it has, that the building department has to be called out. And they're going to be right on that property line that you share with Bombix, because that's what the ruling is, is the property line. And with the other business, you know, the property lines were back a little bit. So, um, mm -hmm. so it's going to be sort of high stakes. I think it might be very difficult to stay within, I mean, maybe modifications. I am not a sound engineer or an architect. Um, so maybe sound modifications can be made. It just seems common sense tells me that it would be very, very difficult to keep it um, below the acceptable uh, acceptable noise limits right on that property line. Anyway, having said all that, I don't know if that's something that we could would be a sort of a workaround to say that we allow X number or one and that the as a test and the building department needs to be there making um, measurements. And I know, and so just so I'm clear too, we're talking about, so this, this entertainment license that we're um, approving perhaps with modifications is just for the rest of this year, correct? Is that right, Annie? Uh, I mean, it'll be renewed in you know, December, but there won't be any changes made. Okay, so there's it not an option to say this is for this year. We right, it renews as yeah. is in December. Okay. Um, Any changes or modifications would require a public hearing. Jennifer, what do you think? I'm thinking that there, there are noise ordinances in force throughout the city. So if we had the city department support, you know, that could be measured. Um, I'm struggling with Helen's suggestion, you know, if we open it up to X amount of events and see if the city can measure the noise at each event. Um, but I also want Bombix to succeed and I'm, I'm not sure what that number is or how best to right. support them while supporting the neighbors. Um, yeah, and let me clarify, I'm talking only about the outdoor events. I, right, oh, I'm sorry, me too, right. I'm concerned with that outdoor. Yeah, 300 to 500 tickets. I, I don't know with Scott and Carrie. I mean, I, I see both sides. Mm -hmm. yeah. Cassandra. Oh, I need to. Thanks, Annie. Yeah. Um, well, I would like the, for the, the opportunity for us to sort of experiment and work on this. Like, you know, again, I think we've demonstrated our willingness to like work with the neighborhood and come up with a solution. Um, you know, I'm, I would feel frustrated if, you know, I mean, I'm happy to get our indoor license, but I feel like, you know, having an opportunity, you know, if we have, you know, a dozen or 15 or however many events that we can do outside to sort of figure this out. Um, I think that's a productive path forward. Um, and then, you know, provided we get to a solution that feels really workable, you know, then we can come back to this other number, but I would like the opportunity to sort of explore this as opposed to just putting it on hold. Yeah, well, putting it on hold doesn't mean saying no, and then it just stays on no. It would have been, we would have meant hearing from the neighbors, which we just have, which is, thank you for speaking, you guys. Um, I just lost my train of thought. Um, Jennifer, did you have something? You, you're, you're nodding <laughs> while I get my thought back. <laughs> <laughs> Not to put you on the spot. No, I think some kind of a continuation where Bombix could operate, like I said, while the city obtains information would be the best path forward. But if Annie can help us to move forward in that regard, I think that would be helpful. I mean, the other approach is sort of what happened um, unintentionally, maybe with other entertainment licenses is and uh, you know uh, 
Natasha, I know you're saying it's, it's hard to sort of reel things back, is that we go ahead and improve. And then there is the opportunity that this gets challenged, you know, uh, you know, not to put it in the laps of the neighbors, but what happens on our end is we say, yep, do it. And then if there's numerous complaints from neighbors or neighbors are calling the building department to come out, um, you know, and, and check sound levels, then it comes back. Um, and and I, I guess what we're trying to avoid, Cassandra, is like going through any ugliness. Um, but at the same time, you probably get the sense like we don't want to be this heavy hand that says, no, you can't do these things that might make your business thrive. But of course, we want to do everything in a way that that is pleasant for the neighbors as well, because otherwise it will just you know, you right, and we want, and that, want that too. I yeah. mean, and it I mean, the other like... piece is this license renews at the end of the in December. So, right. obviously, we're not going to do thirty outdoor events between now and then. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I feel like we could then, you know, the next like reasonably, we're not doing outdoor events again until the spring or summer of any, you know, frequency. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I feel like that intervening six to eight months is really a useful time for thinking through, you know, how we do that, continuing to do our sound measurement and mitigation, continuing our process with our architect around how we do that. You know, I have had him come and look at our landscaping and suggest some solutions and materials that could be used, you know, including fencing, you know, that could, that could address some of this. So, you know, again, I think we've demonstrated that we want to be really good neighbors. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to have 30 outdoor rock shows, um, but I would like the opportunity to, you know, to try some things with the understanding that, you know, we'll try some things and some things will work better than others. Like some things will be great solutions and some things will be not great solutions and we'll move away from the things that are less effective and toward the things that are. Um, and every license has language on it that the license commission has the right to amend it. So there is that piece, but I think also, that there's the practical piece of it in terms, and I know we're heading, you know, we're approaching the winter months, so this isn't going to be an issue, but the practical piece of like you, if you're going ahead and booking acts, which I'm sure you have to book out several months um, to get the touring performers that you want, I really don't want you to be in a position where, where everything just goes south in terms of the sound piece of this and then you, you've got a calendar that you have to cancel. Like we want to avoid that also. That's not something that we want to, have occur so that's part of my thought process yeah i think that makes a lot of sense i mean you know if we come back to thinking about you know approaching this with a more limited number and then understanding that you know provided we come up with a solution that feels effective and you know good to everyone we could then increase that number that would enable us to you know move ahead with booking things but also you know, not be in a zone where we have, you know, sort of like we did this past summer, which is like a whole season of things that we then have to move inside and that becomes financially non-viable. You know, that seems like a compromise where we can continue to do our work, but, you know, you haven't given away the store. Yep. Can I ask, and I do see that Carrie has her hand up, but um, Cassandra, with the outdoor, it is wanting to do the outdoor 100% because of the fear of COVID? Because I'm just curious, because because historically people just don't want to go inside or is it just wanting to have the whole area available as a venue or because it's nice to be outside or, you know? Well, it's actually, it's both of those things. So, you know, we do want to have the whole space available for performance. Um, the backyard is beautiful and it's wonderful having, you know, having entertainment there. Um, you know, and at the same time, like we've really seen, you know, indoor programming is substantially less popular, particularly over the summer, like people just didn't want to be inside. And, you know, I mean, we made investments in air conditioning and, you know, solutions to make that as comfortable as possible. Um, you know, one of the early concerns is that there was no air conditioning, um, you know, inside. And so, you know, when we knew that we couldn't have programming outside, we made that investment and, um, but it's really true that in this COVID era, like it's just really hard to bring people together inside. Like, you know, people are afraid and many people have, you know, vulnerable friends or relatives that they're really considering. And, you know, it's not like before, like, I mean, I, I can see night and day the difference and all of the programming that we moved inside over the summer lost money. And it's, I mean, it's frustrating, right? Like it, you know, and, 
it's our programming. It's also things like I mentioned, this bar mitzvah and the synagogue moving all of their, like trying to move their holiday services outside and then it's raining. And, mm -hmm. you know, like I've done more tent rentals in the past six months than I ever imagined I would. Right. <laughs> and here we have like 13,000 square feet of space that nobody wants to be in. It's right. Right. I guess know, I'm not, I'm sorry. It sounds sort of dramatic about it. But it's just, uh, it yeah. I, I get it and I understand the pain. It's just, it's, it is true. It's just that we're in this very new territory. It did not used to be a thing that like IHEG also wants to be outside, you know, or Academy of Music also wants the outdoor space. You know what I mean? It was sort of like, this is your space. And no matter what the season, this is where you're perform performing. So it's just this funny thing that we've encountered now where it's like, oh, but now we need to have the option to be outside. And then of course, coming outside, um, you know, you butt up against all these other issues because you are smack dab in the middle of the neighborhood um so that's more conversational i don't know if that moves it moves us you know forward in any direction it's just i guess i sort of share that frustration it's like you have thirteen thousand square feet of space as you said and wouldn't it be nice to just be able to use that and then work on the sound in mm -hmm. that area and not even have this issue with with having to move outside and so i guess yeah and and, I, and we are also doing that um you know with the hope that eventually you know we get to some other place with this, but, you know, as I mentioned before, I mean, I know we're sort of making this differentiating between things like weddings and bar mitzvahs, but, you know, those events are also governed by the noise ordinance and governed by the agreement we have with our neighbors about how late we go. So in terms of impact on the neighborhood, those are really in the same category. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, while they, you know, sit in a different, different place in terms of licensing, you know, in terms of like how I think about, you know, our relationship in the neighborhood and how, like, how our neighbors feel about us, like those things are as, you know, inconsequential or as disruptive as an outdoor concert. Yeah, right. Right, because it's all the time. I mean, I sort of think like, oh, if my neighbors want to like celebrate some event, that's great, make all the noise you want. But if they want to celebrate it every week, then that's a different issue <laughs> right that's a different thing altogether and then you know keep in mind with any of these outdoor events you know it's also anything outside is gover governed by weather so it's not as though like exactly all 30 of them whatever they are would necessarily be outside it's that there's the option to have them outside and then you know if it's cold or rainy or whatever yeah. you know we make a different choice and is the is so your application is to approximately two a week is the 30 that you're at hoping to do outside included in that number of two a week or is it in addition to it's included in that number okay, okay. all right um let's hear one more time from um scott and carrie i see their hands are up and then i think we'll should be ready to make some decisions I wanted to just make a suggestion, something that um, Kyle and Cassandra and the neighborhood group had talked about at uh, one of our earlier meetings in the sanctuary, maybe in June, I'm not sure when, uh, about doing the sound transmission testing. Um, and I, I was lucky enough to actually uh, be part of that at 33 Holly a few months ago, in which a group called the Centec, I think they're from Eastern Massachusetts, but there's they're uh, indoor sound transmission folks. They work with theater. Well, they do all sorts of stuff, but they do work with theaters. Um, and given that uh, 33 Holly has two back-to-back -back performance spaces um, that share a wall, as well as having a train line that shares a wall with their rear wall, uh, sound transmission was a huge deal for them. And so I got to watch as they set up a speaker and use different... Um, I guess, decibel meters to uh, test and calibrate and see how much noise they were creating in that space, and then go into different spaces and see how and where tra sound transmitted through walls, um, both from space to space indoors, as well as to outdoors. Um, and it seems like that's something that could be done right away, even in the winter. Um, and then we get some hard data and actually know how sand, sound transmits both from the sanctuary to the outside, as well as from the backyard to the neighbors or to the street or whatever. Um, 
it, it didn't seem, I mean, I think sure had a lot of technical looking equipment, but I'm not sure it was tremendously complicated. Maybe that's something we could reproduce ourselves or hire um, uh, consultants to do. That was, I just wanted to th throw that out there, something that we could do right away and actually get some real information. Um, and I also suggest that in part because every show is going to be different. I think it's hard to get a, a real read with just a single show that becomes a data point as opposed to a lot of data points where it's testing can do a, um, a much broader range of noise, basically. All right, thank you. Thanks. Okay, Carrie. Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you for all this. And I think um, just this is sort of dovetailing, I guess, with what Scott just said is, you know, would there be a way to approve Bombix's, you know, request, but have a contingency that the city will agree to measure X number of um, outdoor shows during this sort of um, experimental period that Cassandra was referencing? Um, so like, do, is there just a way to do something like that so that the burden of figuring this out is on the city who's granting the licensure and Bombix who is putting on the events and less on us as the neighbors to wait and see what happens and have to file complaints. Cause we, you know, as we've said to, to Cassandra and Kyle, like we really don't want to do that. It just seems there's a way, and again, this is not my field. So it seems simple to me, even though I'm sure it's not, but I like, I can't imagine that your business model requires you to exceed the noise ordinance, you know, in the venue that you're, that you're in. So there must be a way to just kind of help ensure that there, you know, you're in compliance, whatever that means, you know, whatever that would require for outdoor shows or, or indoor shows. So maybe there's just a simple way at this point to get that to like allow everything to go through and also get the data points that would be needed to help figure out what needs to happen. So that, because, you know, Cassandra's right, right? Like the noise ordinance applies whether it's indoor or outdoor, yep. right? As I understand it. So that's a, a sort of a question, I guess, or, a, you know, Proposal. So to, to speak to that sort of broadly, the building department, if you have a noise complaint, the building department is the are the people who conduct the decibel counts. We can't burden the building department with this task of helping Bombix figure out their sound impact. Um, that's just outside of the purview of what we can do. I think the best thing that Bombix could do would be to hire this outside company, Centec. I think that might actually be the company that was used by another establishment for some sound consulting. I don't know, um, but that's that's got to remain on you guys, I think, to to work to to do that. Um, Annie, when we have we have on one occasion asked the building department to go and do the decibel count, right? Yes, it was after the con the consultant came in and made recommendations for any sound mitigation efforts, and then app and then it was the building department was um, the license commission requested that they be at the first show, yep. um, and they and they were, and then they reported back, and everything was a okay from everything was fine. Yeah. Yeah. Again, that decibel count was done at the property line, which was many, many, I don't know, several hundred feet away from the establishment. So I think this will be different. Natasha, can I ask you, please, do, do, is there a conditional approval that you see could happen Definitely. that could move Bombix forward and keep the burden where it should be? And mm -hmm. I do. I mean, the I don't want to be overly involved with managing that. I don't think that we should. That's you know something that we should be taking on. Um, you know, and we're and we're kind of heading into this dead zone weather-wise, where there's you know it's not going to be an issue. There's not going to be outdoor events. So on the one hand, it is the perfect time to, for them to engage with some sound people, but there's nothing to measure if they're not having the outdoor entertainment. Um, you know, we, we have in the past, I think for the last time when we did do that decibel count, it was contingent on 
the count being within the limits of the city noise ordinance. So we, you know, that's doable again here. Um, Kyle, I'll take your comment, but then we're going to stop the comments so we can we can discuss a solution here. But what do you have to say? I, I was just going to say that you know I think Scott's idea is a good idea. I think we're in this learning process, and you know, with, there's nothing's going to happen outdoors that resemble a concert, and you know, and, until next spring or summer. So this is a good time to to do some measurements and, and understand because I think partially like there's measuring and understanding the factual data. And then there's also discussing and understanding like the ordinance is one thing and how things feel comfortable next door could be a different thing. You know, like th there's a conversation to be had here and there's there's education around this whole thing, you know, because sound isn't a constant thing either that, that uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot more nuance, I guess, to the measurement of, of all of this. Um, it's not, it's it's not as simple. Um, so I think that that process would allow us all to um, look at some information, share some experiences together and talk about it and understand what that means and, and try to find the right balance and, and see what ends up being appropriate. Um, and we have time to do that because there's nothing happening outside other than non-concert related events. All right, so commissioners, let's um, come up with a motion here. That sounds like, uh, Natasha, do you wanna start by suggesting without making a motion? Cause it sounds, uh, yep. I am feeling that, that, that you have something in mind. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I'm thinking on the practical side, I don't wanna say yes, approve the license for the 30 events and then have all of this work be done and complaints happen and everything else and they have to walk back bookings that they've already made. So I would be more inclined to limit that number to 10 or 12. Um, and, you know, with the conditions that they continue to work with the neighbors that they work, you know, we can't tell somebody to hire a sound company, but it sounds like the willingness to do that is there. And then when outdoor events happen, ask, you know, request that the building department go there and assess the decibels. But like you had pointed out earlier, Helen, the property line is right there. So it's gonna, you know, yeah. it's gonna be a different, I'm not sure exactly what that decibel count is going to accomplish other than say, yeah, it's really loud right here. Exactly, yeah. Um... And you know, part of why this is a difficult discussion for us is we really didn't want to trample on the work that you've all done together as as neighbors and um, within the community. Like that was important to us to you know to honor that in some way. Okay. Yeah. So it's a tricky thing because uh, um, you know there's different approaches to it, but the if it's loud, it's loud, you know, and I don't, and the nature of what the outdoor event is may change that. I don't know, maybe somehow it's easier to listen to a bar mitzvah than a concert. I don't know. Um, but um, what am I trying to say? In, in some ways, it doesn't matter the number of outdoor events. It's almost arbitrary, the number of outdoor events, um, you know, because does it get to the point where it's any event is unacceptable? And, and I guess I don't want to be the one to say that that is the case. Um, and yet again, it's throwing it back in the laps of the neighbors. I mean, I, I have hope because Bombix and the neighbors, you've been working so well together that that will continue to happen so that if we as a licensed commission say, yes, you're approved to, for everything you've asked for, then um, the hope is that, is that then it'll be worked out, you know, amongst you all. I mean, and and... If, if it's not gonna work to have the outdoor entertainment, then that won't, whether or not the entertainment license allows for it, it just won't continue. Or, um, which I don't wanna see, it comes back to us again in the public hearing format, and then we have to make the decision to say you can no longer have outdoor entertainment. I don't know if that's making sense, but, it, but it's, I guess what I'm saying is, does it make a difference if we say, yes, we're approving that, but you can only have 10 outdoor events versus, we're approving it how you've asked for, and we're hoping that it all works out. You 
Jennifer, what are your thoughts on that? Um, from what I'm learning, measuring the sound, I mean, I think there, there is a benefit this is outside of my expertise, but we would have more data if, for example, someone attended 12 or 15 shows versus just sampling and collecting data from one. Uh, but I don't know if we set a number. And then what does the number mean now in October? You know, so if we if we allow for 15 shows, Here in October, I mean, is that meaningful? Would that provide meaningful data to decide if the license should be approved as presented? I feel like we have the calendar going against us in a way. Yeah, I mean, none of this will be sorted out until yeah. spring and summer. So then it's back to Helen's point that the number is almost arbitrary. I mean, unless like we had done with the other thing, it's sort of like one a month, you know, but I also, I, I don't like being in the position to saying like, this is how you need to run your business. Mm -hmm. uh, but when obviously you've already made efforts to make it acceptable to the neighbors, whatever you're doing, um, you know, um, health in the other case, there was a little bit of handholding that had to say like they, that the neighbors can only handle this, hearing this once a month. <laughs> you know? So that, so that's going to be the limit. Um, but I'd rather not be big brother and, and be making those decisions. Um, so I don't know where that leaves us. And we also can't mandate, I think that these things be done. It sounds like there is, now you're talking about there's gonna be reasonable efforts. I hope to maybe bring in some consulting firm or something like that to figure this all out ahead of time. Because as you know, Cassandra, as we've said multiple times, you can get to the situation where, you know, the neighbors do file complaints, which I know the neighbors don't even wanna do, but, and then we're just doing this again. Um, so I'm talking in circles. I don't know if that's moving us forward at all, but, um, I mean, I guess part of me is sort of, uh, you know, making that argument that we approve it as is, and we hope that uh, the relationship continues amongst mm -hmm. Bombics and the neighbors and that, you know, every effort is done to make sure that you can actually have those outdoor events without really upsetting a lot of people and making it, you know, practically unlivable for during that time. You know, I, I certainly understand the perspective of the neighbors. At the same time, I'm so delighted that your business is here. I just want to make that clear, that it's, <laughs> it's so exciting that Florence has become the center but um, of a lot of cool things. But if it's untenable for the neighbors, then it's all I'm done. Um, then it sounds like your perspectives are that the number of outdoor events is actually arbitrary because there's the work that needs to happen to in between now and that occurring anyways, to collect information. Is that? Yeah, I, I, I guess so. I mean, you know, I don't know. How are you feeling about that? Right, especially if we're not ordering the, the testing, yep. then it does feel a little arbitrary. Okay. Bombex has done the work. They'll continue to do the work. I mean, I, I do trust, there, there is some trust here. So I do think Cassandra and Bombex, I mean, they've they've established a pattern of trying to make this work. So I, I do give them the benefit of the doubt there. I think even the neighbors support that, yeah. um, that, that an effort has been made. And I have no reason to think that they would discontinue that effort. So I'm leaning towards Helen to approve and trust that the work continues and that the communication and the partnerships continue to, to make this coexist. Okay. So Cassandra, we just to sort of reflect again on this, on another experience that we had with an establishment that had outdoor music that was disturbing to the neighbors is we, you know, it was several months of meetings and public hearings and it was difficult. It was a very different situation. Nobody was doing what you all have been doing. So again, you're to commend you for that. But what we ended up having to do was we did have to walk it back and we had to um, impose a limit on how many outdoor music performances that um, establishment could have. So 
I just wanted to reiterate that if there are issues, if things can't be brought to a manageable place for neighbors and there's ongoing complaints that we would have to walk back a license. It's the, the possibility is there. Um, yes. I think Annie's unmuting you. Yeah, and it's just, you know, it's in our best interest to yeah. have a positive relationship with our neighbors. Totally. Like, yeah, you've made that totally. We are 100% yeah. committed to that. Like we've done that so far and we will do that going forward. Yeah. You know, it, it doesn't benefit us or them to be in an ad adversarial relationship or to get you involved to walk things back or have to monitor or enforce or do yeah. any of that. Like really, we want to find the path where everybody feels good. Yep, okay. All right, then I think we're ready. And can I just one thing? Yes. They are, Bombix is, is this correct, at liberty to call on the building department and say, we'd like you to come and monitor, correct? I mean, I know at one point we sort of sent people out, but but it doesn't have to be have a complaint that. that generates that, I think. Right, Annie? Yes. Oops, you're muted. <laughs> yeah. um, Possibly, I, I don't really know. I haven't really. I mean, I I know that Councillor Jarrett and Councillor Maori have been involved in conversations on this topic. So I I feel like there's a level of city involvement already happening. So I don't see why they couldn't just do that, request that of the of the building department themselves. Yeah. But I don't know, I'm not the building department. Bombix or city council? Both. Oh, um, I mean, the city council, I mean, it's, they're, they're not the executive branch. They're different. So they, they. Right. But they've been working with Bombix on, right. and the neighbors just in, you know, keep sort of keeping track of informal agreements and things like that. Right. I was your question if they, they can order the building department out there yep. or ask i mean basically ask for them to come and do a measurement i honestly don't know okay. i honestly don't know if that has to come from within or I, I i don't know i mean it would say you know you can make the argument that they are city service and we pay our taxes and all that kind of stuff i would <laughs> think but, but i don't know if that's something that can just is considered a city city service for anyone who who asked for it that was all off the record, right? No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. No, I, <laughs> but I mean, if we have a city, we have a city ordinance. So I mean, if right. we're trying to measure compliance of a city ordinance, somebody has to be the yeah. enforcer. And it sounds like the enforcer would be the building department. So. Right. But I mean, if, if residents were, were able to call the building department and order noise ordinances, they'd probably be out there all the right. time doing it with yeah. disputes and oh my neighbor's playing his guitar That's too loud leaf, blow, and, leaf blowers yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. good point I, I don't i don't know yeah, yeah. okay cassandra And we're offering to do that type of measurement like i don't want to put it on yeah. the city that you have to send somebody from the building department once or twice a week like we right that that's part of our learning is to gather that information. So okay, great. Yeah, that, hopefully we don't have to engage with them in that way. Like they can, you know, do yeah. their other thing. <laughs> All right, great. Yeah, thank you for that. Sure. All right, are we ready then to make a motion? I think so. I'll let you lead. <laughs> You're gonna let me lead that one. <laughs> All right. I will make a motion to approve the application for a, actually, okay, before I do it first, the our applications are woefully inadequate in terms of soliciting information. So I want to be specific in terms of adding into the motion that it's for two events a week, um, an average of two events a week, either indoors or a maximum of 30 outdoors. Is that what you're thinking, Cassandra? Yeah, I think what was articulated in the paperwork I submitted to Annie was that it was a total of 120 a year, 30 of those. It was the option for 30 of those to be outside. Okay. And Annie, for hours, I know that there was um, in your notes, someplace I saw something about Sundays can't start until one. Those, that was for the mayoral license. Oh, okay. Forget it then. Okay. 
And so we have that happens anyway by virtue of the fact that the congregation has their worship service True. in the morning. Yep. So. Yep. Okay. They do their thing, and then whatever happens happens after that. Okay. Very good. Then I will make a motion to approve the application for the new common victualler license and a new entertainment license for Bombic Center for Arts and Equity at 130 Pine Street in Florence. And this would include 120 events approximately a year in, uh, with a, up to 30 outdoors between the hours of 8.30 a.m. and 10 p.m. Is that good, Annie? Um, yes, except for the events that happen at 11. Um... Yeah, in the agreement, in the paperwork I sent and in with the ag agreement with the neighbors, there is the exemption that, that we can have a handful of events that go until 11, provided we um, communicate with the neighborhood in advance right. and let them know. Right, I just mean, Natasha, for the motion, because... Uh, um, you said between 8.30 a.m. and 10 p.m. So, we... so between 8.30 a.m. and 10 p.m. with the occasional programming to last until 11 p.m. with notice for the neighbors. Okay, so you, you just want to leave it at occasional programming? I think so. Should okay. it be, do you think it should be something else? I thought it was, was it six special events? Oh, was it up to six? I don't see any number in the in the agenda for how many that would be the occasional programming will last occasionally programming will last until 11 p.m but there's no number yeah it just, just it says occasionally yes on the application it says in the um in the the notes that Cassandra had sent, it um, it was 120 events, six special events per year, which performances will go until 11 p.m. I don't know. I don't know if you want to say that or not. Uh, um, can I just ask because you know there is an entertainment application in front of us, and it seems like that's what we can approve. I mean, like we're not necessarily making amendments. You know, that's how it's written, and aren't we just sort of approving it as written? I mean, the other detail is something that was communicated separately. Yeah, the only thing in the application that isn't specified is the indoor or versus outdoor. That's the only thing that's not in there. Oh, true. And again, that's, that that's the itself. fault of our application. Right. Yeah, I mean, you can make any modifications okay. to the application that you that you want. Yep. Yeah. All right, so I think, I th can you read back the motion? Um, that you approve the application for the Common Vic and Entertainment to include 120 events, approximately 120 events a year with up to 30 outdoors between 8.30 a.m. and 10 p.m. with the occasional programming lasting until 11 p.m. with notice to the neighbors. Is someone ready to second or do we need second. a further amendment? I'll second. Okay. Okay, um, and Natasha? Yes. Helen? Yes. And Jennifer? Yes. Okay. All right. Thanks everybody. Thank Keep you, Scott and Perry. Thanks for coming up and sharing your support. That really meant a lot. Good luck with everything. Good yes. luck working it all out. Yes. <laughs> all right, moving along. Agenda item 17, approval of minutes. Can I have a motion to approve um, September 7th? Yes, I'll make a motion to approve the minutes of September 7th, 2022. I'll second. I will second. Oh, Jennifer seconds. Oh, sorry. Natasha? <laughs> yes. Helen? Yes. And Jennifer? Yes. Uh, new business, Annie, do you have anything? I do not. Um, we, the, I, my only new business that I would just want to suggest is at some point we talk about if we need to make amendments to the entertainment license application so that people can be more clear in what they're doing indoor versus outdoor, all that sort of stuff. I can, um, 
for the next meeting, I can bring you a proposed new application and you can make comment, make suggestions to change it, add things, and then you can vote on it. And then if we go ahead and make a new one, then it, uh, everyone who's done, does that mean for this ne next year when people fill out the application, it's going to be a little bit different for anyone? Right. Who's it would license, just, be, right? it would just mean the entertainment license going forward would be different. Right. So then that would apply the next year. I'm, it's funny, I did an entertainment license in the past and I can't remember, does it automatically re-up or do you actually physically fill it out every year? Um, you physically fill out a combo renewal that has common Vic. It has, you check off the licenses that you, that you're renewing and then it's like all the basic information. Oh, okay. So they wouldn't, so I guess that's my question is like, it's going to essentially be a new form, but if people already have an entertainment license in place, they're not actually going through that form itself and refilling it. Correct. Out. Because, just, yeah. Because if there was to be changes on the renewal that like, like if they like check something else off on the renewal that the, the commission would have to then vote on that change. So right. this, is just, this is just to update the entertainment application for any new applications. Huh, right. I wonder if just to complicate things. <laughs> if it makes sense with people who we know, then we have to go through the whole thing again. I mean, I'm just thinking in a case like Bombix, where we know like, oh, it actually is indoor and outdoor, and we don't have an entertainment license that says it. We just have this minutes from the meeting that says it. Do we say, we'd like you to fill out a new one and go through the process again? Or is that something to discuss? I mean, that, you know. I mean, it's going to say on their license that it's indoor, like what's indoor and what's outdoor. Are you saying... on? I mean, it doesn't currently say that the current. They don't have a license yet. You're talking. You're talking about. I'm Bombix. talking about. Yeah, Bombix, for example, because I mean, I'm looking at their application. And isn't that? Do they? Do you then? What's going to be posted? Natasha, Natasha yeah. specified in her motion that what was indoors and what was outdoors. So now I'm going to. Okay. Like put that language on their actual license. Okay, that's the piece I didn't quite get because I'm just looking at the application they submitted. Yeah. I didn't know if you just stamp approved and that's what it is. It's like it sounds like no, you actually no, I actually because yeah. whatever's on their application doesn't mean that that's what gets approved because the commission has the the authority to make changes or modifications to it. So okay. whatever language is approved in the motion that I put on the actual license. Okay, great. Got it. Yeah, but this clarification would be helpful moving forward. So, yeah, because I realized that she just chose to tell us that. Otherwise, we really wouldn't have any information right. it, unless we right. just asked her and said, hey, are you going to do any outdoor concerts? If we hadn't thought about it and she hadn't volunteered that right. information. Right. Right. Which is actually why, be able to do whatever she wants, <laughs> which is which is why Natasha brought it up, because this application prompted us to have a conversation right. about changing the application. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm caught up. Thank you, Natasha. Yeah. It it is an interesting thing. I don't want to like keep everybody late at six already, but um you know, allowing concerts in that location outside. And I do firmly believe that concerts are not bar mitzvahs. <laughs> I think they're two <laughs> totally different things. Um it almost is so I know that they're rezoned office industrial from urban residential. Um, does that change? I mean, the noise ordinance is a noise ordinance, so it's going to be the same everywhere. But like Helen, I think it was you who pointed out the property lines right there. There's there's no way at that property line that they're going to be within the 60 decibels or whatever it is. Whatever decibels are allowed. <laughs> and then what happens? Right. You know, so then is is it up to the neighbors do you know it comes going to come back to us at that point and the neighbors seem very amenable to working with this but also you know it sounds like it's also very loud for them. yeah i think they're being very very nice considering yeah it's, i mean the fact that i mean what's very concerning is it's loud when it's inside right <laughs> i can't 
But that communication has been wonderful. I mean, I've yeah, seen yeah. the no parking signs. I know that they yeah. are leasing parking spaces in yeah. other areas. I wish my neighbors were as considerate. Yes, totally. really. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah, so I, I have to give them credit where credit's due. And even the neighbors were very kind and said that they appreciated the outreach. So yeah, yeah. I'm glad that we gave her some room to try and Mm -hmm. Yeah, and maybe if it is too loud right there, maybe maybe they can use, I mean, I know they're using the parking lot at the Florence um, Community. Civic Center, the Civic Center, but maybe behind the Civic Center right. is a more appropriate place for live music. Right. I don't know. All right. Thanks, everyone. Yes. Anything else? No. no?